Pastor Eric Schaefer, the senior pastor here at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Santa Monica, California, and this is Hope Matters. Each week, I talk to an interesting person from around the community and even around the nation and around the world about the theme of hope, because we believe that hope matters. My guest today is Dr. Jose Zambrana, Jr., who is the director for music and worship here at Mount Olive, and in his non mount out of life. He also works for the Environment, our Environmental Protection Agency. That's a mouthful, Jose. The e it is. <laughs> and, and has lots of other interests in his life, and we'll talk about all of those. So hello, so Jose. So glad you could join us today. Absolutely. It's an honor. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for inviting me to have this conversation. So um, our viewers as you know, are not just Mount Olive people and just Lutheran people. So let's start with your churchy life. Uh, how did you become the, an, an organist and a, and a vocalist and a pianist? Uh, how, tell us a little bit about that, that journey. Sure, absolutely. It started early in my life. I um, grew up mostly in a Baptist church and I started playing piano when I was like seven and I had really good uh, mentors, like musical mentors at that Baptist church. And they really got me into playing the piano in church and singing in the choir. And by age 16, I was accompanying hymns for one of you know, the services. So, and that was really great because I learned how to follow. Because if you sing in a Baptist church, it's, there's a song leader and you got to watch them because sometimes they'll stop or pause or go faster, go slower. So, um, and that really just became part of my lifeblood. Um, at that church, they had an electronic organ and I was not interested in it. Um, when I went to Houghton College, which is a Wesleyan college in Western New York, they had a beautiful pipe organ in the chapel and I just became in love with it. It was like, wow, that's a pipe organ. And um, so I talked to the organ director, the organ uh, professor, and she said, yeah, why don't you learn? And um, I'm so glad I did because now it's become sort of this avocation and I have um, played in churches uh, ever since I graduated from, from college. I started in New York City playing in Episcopal churches and then uh, moved to Lutheran churches and I've kind of stuck with just playing in Lutheran churches and I, I, I love playing in Lutheran um, churches because of the liturgy and there's a lot of music and a lot of history and theology. So it's, I find myself at home. Thank you. I, lo I love to tell the story of how you came to Mount Olive. I, 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 hope, I think my version is a little close, is close to your version, but I always tell people that God sent you to us because uh, when, and for the benefit of our viewers, when Jose first came, um, Mount Olive had a, actually she wasn't a long time organist, but she had been here for what, maybe 10 years, Jose, uh, and, and much below Pat Mamone, who was dying of cancer. Actually, she was dying of cancer from the time I came here and hung on for a while. And uh, you came on two Sundays and was she already, she was not gone, but she was sick and not there. Is that what I remember? Right, that, that was correct, yeah, we had, um with a friend of mine, uh, we were church hopping and my friend said, oh, this church is known for their organ and that they play Bach. So <laughs> we came to Mount Olive and I think at that time she was sick that Sunday, um, but we participated in the service. I remember at the end of the service, I just had this feeling and it was, I actually turned to my friend and I said, I'm feeling something. <laughs> And she was like, what? I was like, I feel like God wants me to be here. I, they, I haven't even met the pastor or anything. I just had that feeling like, this is where you're gonna be. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let me go introduce myself. <laughs> and you walked up to me and said, your first words to me after your name were, I think I can help you, pastor. Yes, yes, because you had said that the organist was sick and I thought, well, I can at least substitute or offer music um to help during the time and look here we are we so are <laughs> i mean you know and you know as i say god god sent you to us yeah the sad story for those of you that don't know is that pet actually didn't come back and died shortly thereafter um and um i was honored to be her at her bedside the day before she died and uh and her friend um uh, but yeah but you've been with us since then. And I, I forget what year that was, but yeah. 
I think 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. Something around there. <laughs> and then the other, another part of your life is working for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and you have this interesting assignment for them working with Native American tribes. Uh, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about how you got to the EPA, because you have a PhD in chemistry. Is that I right? I do. Yes. Yeah. So um, I actually turn back a little bit because I don't tell this part of my story too often, but I was on my way to med, to med school. Um, I had studied chemistry and music and I actually was on full scholarship at a medical school. And I was at medical school for three months and I hated it. And I thought this is the, the wrong decision. And I ended up leaving. It was one of the hardest choices early in life because, and I didn't know what, was, what I was gonna do. Um, but after a stint at focusing on church music, I thought, you know, I love chemistry, the topic. So that's when I decided to pursue a PhD in inorganic chemistry I'm in New York City. And um, during that journey, I was like, well, what am I gonna do with this? And I realized I really wanted to apply science to public policy. And that's what brought me to Washington DC and um, being hired at the EPA. And uh, now I've moved out here to LA and I continue to work for the EPA. I work in the Office of Research and Development, which is the science arm of the EPA. And uh, we are a science agency. And um, I work in a center that focuses on environmental modeling and measurement. And um, I do all sorts of project management of big sort of uh, science research projects, but I also uh, focus on engagement with states and now in particular with tribes. And I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And um, it's been a real honor and humbling experience to work with our First Nations and tribes of the US. And uh, so I, I get to do that work and I learn so much um, in doing that. That's cool. That's cool. Are there particular tribes you work with, or are you basically the, the EPA person for every tribe? Yeah, so we, there's a lot of people at the agency who work with the tribes because um, the, the US government's relationship with tribes is on a government to government basis. And that the US government has what's called a tribal trust responsibility. And so the different programs all have people who work with tribes. So I'm one of others. Um, I've been focusing on working with tribes on science needs and on um, ways of doing science. So how, to, how do we marry the sort of Western approaches to science with, with indigenous um, ways of knowledge and knowing and how do we bring these two things together and work in harmony. And so I work with about, um, 11 representatives of tribes from around the nation on this topic. And I get to work with other ones too, but um, I primarily work with this, a group who focuses on this challenge. Cool, cool, that's wonderful. Um, it, is there a tribal organization separate from the EPA that meets nationally? Do they have a tribal convention every couple of yeah, years? That's a, great, that's a great question. Um, the tribes sometimes will, form organizations that meet, but each tribe really is its own nation. And so um, there aren't any representative groups. They, um, you know, when we are to meet with the tribe, we are to treat them as a nation. Um, the tribal elder or leader is equivalent to the president of the United States. Um, and so, whereas the tribes might gather together to self-organize on uh, around different topics, and they do about air pollution or water pollution or things like that, we, we really try to work one-on-one -on -one, um, when we need to do business. Cool. It's a topic for another day, but you, you may Yeah, have it's I really have fascinating. That. It's, it's I fascinating. Also, <laughs> yeah, well, I also have an American Indian name, so I, well, I'll tell you about that sometime. So okay. Uh, okay. From the Lenin and Nabi, what, we, what the English call the Delawares. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. All right, well, um, now you and I get the privilege of working together on some wonderful things. Um, and e e even during the pandemic, we've, we've been able to do some, I think, pretty creative things with worship and other things. Um, but, you know, this has been a tough year, the last year for hope. Um, you, know, you know, the pandemic, uh, the, the 
elevation of the themes of racial injustice and white supremacy and racism, the economic collapse, uh, and you know, and then all all and behind all this, the the, the march toward climate destruction, which I know you care deeply about, also. So where do you find hope in your life and faith in the midst of all of this? Yeah, wow, that's a big one. And it has been an incredible year. Um, and I think we at Mount Olive have worked hard to create weekly spaces for people to have time with God and with family and with the community. And, um, you know, as a church musician, I am inspired by church song and people singing together and that experience. So it, it's been hard to not do that. But I think in challenges, we, we overcome, right? And we grow. And I think with our experience at the church this, this year has been to explore online, virtual, collaborating on music across vast, uh, distances, you know, trying new things. Um, and that actually has given me hope because it speaks to the human spirit, to the Holy Spirit that works in the world um, through challenges. Um, I was really excited and moved by our Silent Night virtual choir. Um, and this has been an art form that has, that has grown and blossomed during oh, pandemic. Yes. Yeah. And you know, musicians have learned how to sing with each other from afar and, and um, there's been some really spectacular things out there on the internet. And so some of them I turn to time and time again to just listen to. Um, I'll highlight one, which is a piece called Sing Gently. It's um, by Eric Whitaker. And I you know, would point people to that one as well. It's something that gives me hope because it's about People, it's about 17,000 participants from around the world wow. singing in 129 countries, singing together. Wow. And um, so things like that give me hope when you look around and things seem to be falling apart. Thank you. That's, I, I would agree. Um, you know, and um, yeah, it, uh, you've, and you've, you know, we fall back upon those very basics of our faith, which are which are, are are grounded in an ultimate hope, aren't they? You know, at that point. I think so. And um, we're recording this right before Martin Luther King Jr. And you know, I'm always, I guess, inspired by the idea that you know, justice is an arc, right? That. It, the arc bends towards towards justice. And that gives me hope because when you see injustice, when you're dealing with it every day, you think, will it ever get better? You know? And when we come together as a community, when we hold hands, when we make our voices known, when we seek change, that's that arc bending. Um, that's yeah. right. And, and I think I look to the Orthodox sometimes for patience. Um, some years ago, I visited uh, uh, Bartholomew, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church in Istanbul, and they have a seminary on an island in the harbor. Mm. Hasn't been allowed to open for 50 or more years. Mm -hmm. And every day they remake the beds. You know, I you know they they have a longer view of these things. Yes, but, absolutely, so. and that you know that's such an important part of of our heritage as Christians or Lutherans or you know whatever people's faith is. There's always a heritage there, and a history and a vision that looks beyond 2020, 2021 that that sees it in a bigger context. <clears throat> That's right. Well, we could go on for a while on that one. And yeah. I just thought of another whole show we could, you and I could do. <laughs> we'll, we'll spare our viewers that. But thank you, Jose, for being with us and for the, your reflections on your life and hope. And you, you know, for me, how much of a delight it is to, to work with you. 
and how how much I enjoy that and and uh, you know and I'm so happy to know you and Ed personally and all of that. So thank you. Thank you. Likewise, it's been an honor and a blessing since that day I walked in and to have this this relationship with with you and the church and with the other musicians at the church who are amazing. And uh, as we continue the, the good work together. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate this. All right. Okay. This has been Hope Matters, a weekly production of Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Santa Monica, California. Our guest today has been Dr. Jose Zambrana Jr., who is the director for worship and music here at Mount Olive and has a lot of other wonderful aspects to his life when he's not at Mount Olive. And it's been so good to have you with us, Jose. And we look forward uh, for our viewers to next week. Each week, we bring you a new guest. And because we believe that hope matters and we believe in a God of hope. Thank you for being with us.